Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 697 for May 13th, 2018. Coming up in a few minutes. People are recognizing Scotland as being you know, one of the greatest distilling nations on earth. So we are seeing people just falling in love with Scotch and wanting to come and visit the place where it's made and meet the people who make it. Tourism has become a key part of the Scotch whiskey business. Diageo has 28 malt whiskey distilleries in Scotland right now, and 12 of them have visitor centers. While the largest producer of Scotch whiskey won't be opening up any of those other distilleries to the public anytime soon, it will be investing 150 million pounds over the next three years to improve the visitor experience at those 12 distilleries along with opening a new Johnny Walker brand home in Edinburgh. Diageo's Ewan Gunn joins us later on WhiskeyCast in depth to discuss the plans for the project. We'll also have your voice, the calendar of events, the What I'm Tasting This Week department, and on Behind the Label, we'll look into the difficulties in ordering whiskeys online in the U.S. That's all coming up on this edition of WhiskeyCast. Whiskey Cast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. This is whiskey, Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch makers, creating the bold and complex flavour of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Let's start off with the news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. Distillers are descending on Washington this weekend. The Spirits Industry's annual public policy conference gets underway on Monday. While there's a lot of work to be done at the conference, there will also be a lot of work done nearby on Capitol Hill. The tax reform bill passed in Congress late last year included a major break for distillers, with cuts in the federal excise tax on whiskey and other distilled spirits. But that cut is only good for 2018 and 2019. Distillers will be pushing members of Congress to make the cuts permanent, and Margie Lehrman of the American Craft Spirits Association says there's plenty of evidence already to prove the cuts are working. Over a third of our members have already, or if they haven't done already, it's in the plans to hire new employees. Um, I know that they have additionally created additional storage areas, so there's expansion. I know that they have um, actually purchased many more grains, and we're being told that there are new fermenters, new stills, um, in one instance, uh, contemplation for a malt house so that they can malt their own grains in order to make some great products. Bottom line, we've also heard from suppliers as well, which um, didn't think that we would have them reach out to us, but letting us know of the ripple effect that their business has increased because of the demand for distillers to expand their operations. It's, of course, then uh, trickling down to everything from graphic artists to our bottle manufacturers to, in this case, it's actually a software uh, designer, which tracks uh, back-end product and route to market. So a lot of economic impact already just in the first five months. Massive amount of economic impact, yes. Uh, For some distillers, they're saving um, two I can specifically think of. Uh, One instance, $80,000 a year in reinvestment dollars going back into the economy by way of both a pretty substantial hire in the area. Many of these... um, Distillers also, as you know, are in areas that would be otherwise economically depressed in parts of cities or in urban environments that previously had been run down and with the additional funds not going out to pay taxes, but staying there in the distilleries, we're finding that in many of those areas, they're making additional improvements. In terms of the economy, it's not just about hiring, it's also where they are hiring. So this is a great source of income for others that may not otherwise have a job. The conference will also focus on international trade, where American whiskeys risk being caught up in the dispute between the U.S. and the European Union 
over steel and aluminum tariffs. Meanwhile, the Scotch whiskey industry is getting ready to launch its annual battle against spirits taxes in Great Britain. Chancellor of the Exchequer Philip Hammond slammed the industry last year with an excise tax hike of nearly 4% in his spring budget and ignored the industry's pleas for fairer treatment in his autumn budget. This year, the Scotch Whiskey Association will only get one chance to persuade the Chancellor for a cut in duties, according to the SWA's Graham Littlejohn. The tax burden on the average price bottle of Scotch whisky in the UK is 80%. You know, so four every five pounds uh, of Scotch whisky goes directly to the Treasury. We think that's rather high for a uh, product of the importance of, of Scotch whisky uh, to, the, to the UK economy. So we'll be talking to the UK government over the coming months about reducing that tax burden on Scotch here at home. And Hammond kind of shafted you guys a little bit in the uh, spring budget, didn't he? You know, last year was a funny year. We had two budgets last year in the UK. Uh, it's not a not a usual situation. And in the first budget in the spring, we 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 had a, a pretty big increase in in, in duty, three point nine percent increase. Um, we, there was a freeze in duty in in the autumn budget, and and from now on, there will just be one budget a year in the autumn, and that's the the budget this year that we're gearing up to to uh, to try and see whether we can convince the Chancellor of the of the needs to reduce the tax burden on Scotch whisky, which won't only be good for uh, Scotch whisky, but it, our analysis shows that it'll actually be good for government revenues as well. Uh, a, a drop in uh, Scotch whisky duty will actually drive revenue to government. So uh, that's something we'll be talking to the Chancellor about in the coming months. The evidence to back up that argument. When the government cut spirits duties by 2% back in 2015, increased sales led to around 124 million pounds in additional tax revenue for the government. Chancellor Hammond is expected to release his budget in November. One other business note, Pernod Ricard is getting into the beer business for the first time. Its Irish Distillers Division has completed a deal to buy 8 Degrees Brewing in Mitchellston, County Cork, for an undisclosed amount. But there is a whiskey-related reason behind the deal. It gives Irish distillers a long-term supply of beer to use in seasoning the casks for Jameson Caskmates, which until now had been finished in casks from Cork's Franciscan Well Brewing. Franciscan Well was acquired recently by Miller Coors and has been expanding the distribution of its beers. And because of that, it wasn't able to meet the ongoing supply needs for Irish distillers. Irish distillers and Franciscan Well will continue to work together on special projects, though. Turning to new whiskeys now, and speaking of cask finishes, Diageo has unveiled a new George Dickel Tennessee whiskey with some spice to it, namely Tabasco. The Tabasco brand barrel finish was created in a collaboration with Mickelhenny, the owners of the Tabasco brand in Louisiana. It'll sell for about $25 a bottle. And just in case you're wondering, this is not the first whiskey to be finished in a chili pepper sauce cask. Seattle's Westland Distillery did it back in 2016 with Inferno as its April Fool's release that year. Meanwhile, Whistlepig has released the second crop of its farm stock rye whiskey, which uses whiskey distilled at Whistlepig Farm in Vermont. Unlike the first edition released last year, this is a straight rye whiskey, which means the Vermont spirit is now two years old. Here's master distiller Dave Pickerel. Farm stock is a transitional product for us. Um, crop one was, uh, so we call it rye crop one, was 20% was distillate from our Vermont distillery between a year and 18 months old, triple terroir, our water, our grain, and our wood all from the same field. We think we're the first distillery in the world to claim that. Um, the next 49% was five to six year old from Alberta, double terroir, our water and our wood. The last 31% was 12 year old from MGPI, just our water. Um, and the idea was, first of all, it's a, more of an entry-level, easy-drinking product. Um, but we want you to, well, it, it's, we want it to be holistically delicious. I also want you to be able to taste the components because one of our stories is, look, Mom, we're finally making our own whiskey. And uh, um, so you can taste some of the, some of the uh, citrusy, grainy notes from the young rye. You can taste some of the spicy rye from the older rye and some of the big caramel backbone from our wood. Um, crop two 
will be a higher percent Vermont distillate at an older age. And it will continue to grow year on year until finally it's 100% Vermont distillate. And so the elegant answer would be for people to buy two bottles, one to have and one to, to consume, so that by the time we're at 100% Vermont product, they can do a grand vertical and see how bad I screwed up. Farm stock crop 002 is bottled at 43% ABV and will be available in limited amounts for around $73 a bottle. Brook Laddie is giving its Port Charlotte range of heavily peated Isla single malts a shakeup. There'll be a revival of the Port Charlotte 10-year-old single malt that will replace the current Port Charlotte Scottish Barley release, along with the new 2011 vintage of Port Charlotte Isla Barley. Both will be available this summer, along with two cask-strength finished versions coming in the fall, a Bordeaux cask finish and a travel retail exclusive Marsala cask finish. No word yet on pricing. And speaking of Pete, the Whiskey Exchange is out with an exclusive single cask bottling of Loch Lomond's Crofton J heavily peated single malt. It was matured for 10 years in a refill American Oak hogshead cask, and bottled at 54.8% ABV. 289 bottles are available exclusively through the Whiskey Exchange for around 70 pounds each. That's $95 a bottle at current exchange rates. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking Soul. If you're traveling this summer, Look for Highland Park's newest travel retail release at the airport. Voyage of the Raven is a tribute to the ravens that guided Vikings on their voyages. After all, the Vikings didn't have GPS. Get all of the details at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. There's a bourbon cocktail and barbecue dinner this Thursday night, May 17th, at Addie's at the Woodford Inn in Versailles, Kentucky. The Oxford Bourbon Festival and Auction is this coming weekend in Oxford, Mississippi, along with the Lakes Spring Whiskey Festival in England and the Whiskey Show Sydney in Australia. Also in Australia, Whiskey Live Canberra is May 25th and 26th. The Scotch Whiskey Experience in Edinburgh, Scotland has a tasting of Chivas Brothers whiskies on the 26th. And while Ardbeg Day won't be celebrated at the distillery on Isla until June 2nd, Ardbeg Day celebrations actually get underway starting on May 31st in Detroit, Michigan. There are more than 100 Ardbeg Day events worldwide between the 31st and June 9th, we have links for all of them on the calendar at whiskeycast.com, along with details on more than 200 other whiskey events around the world. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreast Lestow Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Lestow. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Listeau edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that will be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. It's harder than ever to have whiskies shipped directly to you, even if you don't have to worry about them clearing customs. FedEx and DHL were all under stress from various states to ensure that they weren't carrying alcohol. Coming up later on Behind the Label, Brett Pontoni of Binney's in Chicago explains why his stores had to stop shipping whiskeys altogether. Right now, it's time for Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin. Whiskey related tourism has become a big business. Just this week, the Cotswolds Distillery in England reached its £2 million goal in a crowdfunding campaign to help raise money for a new visitor's center in just one week. Diageo recently announced plans to invest £150 million, about $203 million, to upgrade the visitor's centers at the 12 of its 28 malt whiskey distilleries in Scotland that are open to the public, along with building a new Johnny Walker brand home in Edinburgh. It's likely the largest single investment ever in Scotch whiskey tourism, 
And while the plans are still being developed, Diageo's Ewan Gunn joined me on the phone this week with a preview. It's really about um, embracing the sort of growing tourism industry in Scotland, and particularly the whisky tourism industry in Scotland, but also really sort of the the interest in, in food and drink globally. Now, obviously, we have um, some some huge and, and popular international brands, and it makes sense to have amazing places for people to come and visit and, and learn about them. So the investments can be sort of split across several different things. Um, one is um, a new state-of-the-art Johnny Walker immersive visitor experience, which is going to be based in Edinburgh. And the second part of that investment is going to be spread across all 12 of our existing distillery visitor centres. So we already do have those visitor centres at 12 of our distilleries. It's really about upgrading and, and enhancing them. Now, within those 12, we have four specific distilleries, um, which we think um, really represent the sort of four corners of Scotland in terms of style and taste. And they're going to be linked sort of directly to that Johnny Walker venue in Edinburgh in terms of look and feel. Um, those distilleries are Glen Kinchy in the Lowlands, um, Cardew in Speyside, Clynleash up, in, up here in the Highlands, where I am, and Kalila on the island of Isla. But we are going to be investing across all of our distilleries. So distilleries such as Lagavulin, Talisker, Oban, for example, we are going to be investing across all of them and, and many others as well. When you say linked, what do you mean by linked? Uh, are we going to see, in terms of style and design, or are we going to see uh, audio-video links so you can see like a webcam from the distillery? When you say linked, what do you define as linked? So certainly linked in terms of, sort of look and feel and style. We are, we are going to be calling out these these four specific distilleries as um, as I said, four corners of Scotland style that is part of the Johnny Walker style and flavour. So in terms of look and feel, they will have a, a theme running right through them. Um, we're still looking at you know options for how we can actually connect directly to them. I mean, webcams could be something that we'll look at, but they are going to be linked. And the idea is that not only will we get lots of people coming to Edinburgh, which you know already is most visited city in the UK after London, but we're going to get people then leaving Edinburgh to actually go to those rural communities as well. So it's not just about bringing people into Edinburgh, but it's also about encouraging people to to get out into the highlands and the islands and explore the rest of Scotland as well. So there is going to be that sort of common theme running right through them. What kind of things are we going to see at this Johnny Walker experience? I know the final name hasn't been determined yet. <laughs> it hasn't, no. We're still very much in the early planning stage. Um, the intention is that it's going to be immersive. It's going to be as interactive as possible. Um, we want people to not just learn about Johnny Walker, but learn about you know how Scotch whisky is made, why it tastes the way it does. So there'll be opportunities to to try different scotches, to try different blended scotches, to look at ways of enjoying Scotch whisky. So we want it to be as interactive and immersive as possible. But you know, as I say, we're we're still very much in the early planning stages. I know that. Uh the Guinness Storehouse and its various uh, immersive experiences and uh, labs and tasting rooms and things like that are going to sort of be the model for this because those all went through a major upgrade two or three years ago under Diageo ownership. Yeah. So I know that you're going to use uh, some of that in planning this, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we look just at last year in 2017, there was 1.71 million people visited the Guinness storehouse and um, that contributed 361 million euros to the Irish economy. So, you know, I think we can definitely say that's been a success story. So we'll certainly be looking at the achievements that we, we had there and looking at how we can take learning from that and apply it to, to the Johnny Walker experience. Yeah. When you say 12 visitor centers around Scotland, yes, we're not counting the one that's going to be at Port Ellen when it reopens uh, probably two years from now, right? That's correct. And also the one that is going to be at Brewer as well. So in total, there will, will actually eventually be 14. The question I had about that, and I was about to ask this, was uh, since Brewer and Klein Leash are essentially neighbors and right across the road from each other, will those be combined into one big experience for both distilleries or will Brewer have its own separate visitor center? I would expect that we'll have two separate visitor centers because the, the one at Klein Leash is going to be, as I mentioned, sort of linked into the Johnny Walker experience at Edinburgh in look and feel, um, whereas the Brewer one I expect will be considerably smaller in scale, but will be you know bespoke to, to Brewer itself. So you can make a day of it. <laughs> okay. 
because that's one that would make sense for a consolidation to save some money. And if you look at it purely from a financial point of view, I suppose it would. But um, the, the two distilleries are, are unique and both special in their own way. So I think it makes sense to, to really have two distinct and unique visitor experiences. You don't have a location yet for the Johnny Walker Center in Edinburgh. Are you looking along the Royal Mile? Are you looking a little further outside uh, of the tourist areas? Where are you looking to put this? They're, they're actually looking at a, a number of options at the moment, um, and I believe they're in conversation with, with several different sites. So, um, you know, they're in conversation with, with developers and also with local authorities. So I'm afraid I, I can't go into any more detail at the moment, but um, beyond saying that it is going to be in Edinburgh itself. Is it fair to say this is going to be sort of the final piece of the timetable since you've still got to get the location, the design, the planning, um, both planning permission and the internal planning? Is this going to be towards the end of the three-year project? Um, I wouldn't expect so, no. I mean, this is obviously quite a major undertaking for, for the business. So I expect there will be sort of more news coming through on, on location and these kind of things you know, fairly soon, I would expect. How important is this becoming now to the Johnny Walker brand, to the Diageo Maltz, because we've always had those 12 visitor centers. We've always had the classic malts, passports that uh, encouraged people to visit those 12 distilleries. But how important is this becoming in terms of the overall marketing of Scotch whiskey and specifically the Diageo brands? I think it's becoming increasingly important because um, we find people, you know, people are coming to Scotland and, and they want to learn about Scotch. I mean, Scotch is it's loved the world over. It's the world's favourite whisky, for starters. Um, you know, and people are recognising Scotland as being, you know, one of the greatest distilling nations on earth. So, we are seeing people just falling in love with Scotch and wanting to come and visit the place where it's made and meet the people who make it. So, you know, this, this really is. It's not just about one brand. Although Johnny Walker, being our biggest Scotch brand, is the key focus. It's about bringing people to the world of Scotch and letting them really immerse themselves in it and and, and learn. By the way, there are no plans right now to add visitors centers at the other 16 Diageo distilleries that are not open to the public. We'll keep you posted on developments as they happen. And that's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, the legendary Isla single malt. Look for the classic 16-year-old Lagavulin, along with the Distillers Edition and the new 8-year-old Lagavulin at a whiskey shop near you. Find out more at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. And with the Kentucky Derby over, horse racing moves on now to the second leg of the Triple Crown this Saturday with the Preakness at Pimlico in Baltimore. Of course, Baltimore was a hotbed of rye whiskey distilling for decades, but that tradition faded away in the years following Prohibition. It's been revived now, and let's look at a couple of ryes with Baltimore ties. We'll start with Epic Rye from the Baltimore Whiskey Company, which was the first distillery in Baltimore to resume distilling rye whiskey a couple of years ago. Epic Rye is a straight rye whiskey bottled at 50% ABV, and the nose is aromatic with good spicy notes of clove, allspice, and nutmeg, along with oak, molasses, and a hint of vanilla. The taste has those same spicy notes, along with a hint of anise that comes out in the background, while molasses and honey add a nice balance. The finish is long and aromatic with lingering spices, a hint of anise, and oak. It's a very nice sipping whiskey, and I'm scoring the Baltimore Whiskey Company's Epic Rye a 90. Sagamore Spirit Distillery is only a year old and still laying down its own spirit for future bottlings, but has released a new Vintner's Reserve Rye using a blend of sourced straight rye whiskies finished in a combination of red wine and port casks. It's bottled at 45.2% ABV, and the nose has notes of dried fruits, muted spices, honey, vanilla, red grapes, and chocolate fudge. The taste is complex and well-rounded with clove, allspice, a slight fruity tartness, chocolate fudge, and a brandy-like note leading into the finish, which is nice and long with spices that fade away smoothly, brandy, and dried fruits. I'm scoring the Sagamore Spirit Vintner's Finish Rye a 92. 
I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute. But first, our tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, where they're making room in the trophy case after the San Francisco World Spirits Competition. Best bourbon, Henry McKenna Single Barrel. The best small batch bourbon, Elijah Craig Small Batch. Just more proof of Heaven Hill's pedigree for making whiskeys with award-winning flavor. Meet the family at heavenhilldistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. And since I've been talking about rye, let's look at the port-finished rye from Pittsburgh's Weigel Whiskey. It's bottled at 46% ABV, and the nose has a good balance of subtle spices and fruit with fresh berries, touches of allspice and clove, dried fruits, honey, and just a hint of oak. The taste has notes of black cherries, clove, and cinnamon spices that develop nicely in the background, along with honey, vanilla, and dried fruits. The finish is medium length and gentle. I'm scoring the Weigel Port Rye Whiskey an 85. And let's finish up with the 16-year-old Lock, Stock, and Barrel Straight Rye from the Cooper Spirits Company. This one is a 100% rye whiskey from an undisclosed distillery, bottled at 53.5% ABV, and the nose has good spicy notes of white pepper, allspice, and ginger, along with honey, brown sugar, and molasses underneath. The taste is spicy with cinnamon and white pepper, balanced well by good fruity notes of black cherries, berry cobbler, and touches of molasses and roasted nuts in the background. The finish is long and subtle with touches of spice and dried fruits. This one gets high marks for balance and complexity. I'm scoring the Lock, Stock, and Barrel 16-year-old rye a 93. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. I'll be adding these whiskeys to our searchable list of more than 2,150 different tasting notes at whiskeycast.com. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch Whiskey. From this place and these places in that place. These are the people that make it. This is what they sound like. Because you're a cheeky wee blighter. Dance like. I like that. This is what they do all day, building the great character of Johnny Walker Black Label. Aging hit Gain Oak for 12 long years. Thanks. Oh, it's gorgeous there. Oh. What is character? It's giving a damn. You're all right, lassie. Which looks like this, as much as this. See, the land that shapes these people and the people that shape this whiskey all shape how bloody good it tastes. Not the bloody game on the telly, Ella. A whiskey as bold as it is complex. For every step you take, this is Johnny Walker Black Label, friends. Step right up. Cup, cup. Can I drink this now? Johnny Walker Black Label Blended Scotch Whiskey. 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Let's open up the inbox now for this week's Your Voice, brought to you by Lot 40. Last time around, I mentioned in our story on the Redbreast Dream Cask that it will not be available in the U.S. because it's only being released in 50 CL bottles. That prompted this note from Jim Cook in Massachusetts on our Facebook page. Mark, you say that the U.S. does not allow imports of 50 CL bottles. I thought the U.S. did not allow imports of 70 CL bottles because 70 CL does not divide evenly into 9 liters required for computing of taxes. 50 CL does divide evenly into 9 liters, so is this a mistake or is there some other reason I'm not familiar with? Thanks, with a couple of tears shed, for not being able to obtain this in the U.S. No, it's not a mistake, Jim. And yes, 50 centiliters does divide into 9 liters. But federal regulations banned the use of 50 CL bottles in 1989. We're not sure why. The only sizes that are allowed in the U.S. are minis of either 50 or 100 milliliters, along with 200 and 375 milliliter bottles. 375s are allowed because that's half of the standard 750 ml or 75 cl bottle. 
And whiskeys can also come in one liter or those big 1.75 handle size bottles. Now, this also rules out those huge magnum sized bottles that you'll see occasionally overseas. Though we should point out that you can bring in other sized bottles from overseas as an individual when you're coming through customs. They just can't be imported legally for sale. Drew in Southern California at Drew7182 on Twitter asked this question on Friday. I've heard that Yamazaki 12-year-old is discontinued from some people and from others that it's not. Do you happen to know the actual truth? I had not heard those rumors, but as we discussed with Dave Broom last time around, almost all Japanese whiskeys are in short supply right now. I checked with Beam Suntory to get the definitive answer, and Drew, the rumor is 100% false. While Yamazaki 12-year-old supplies are tight, a company spokesman told me they do not foresee any issues with keeping it on the market. And speaking of our interview with Dave Broom, Mike Simpson tweeted this note the other day. It was a fabulous interview, Mark. Question, with Dave seeing some distilleries going by the wayside if they don't merge buying power, would you recommend to any collector to try to snap up craft distillery offerings, or would they not be worth it as a potential investment? Hashtag Slancha. Mike, I never recommend buying whiskeys as an investment. I know that there are many people recommending rare whiskeys as a way to make money, but think of it this way. If a craft distillery doesn't last long enough to build a name or a reputation, the chances of its whiskeys becoming valuable years from now probably aren't very good. The main reason, though, that I don't recommend investing in whiskeys is because there really aren't many legal ways yet for an individual to cash in on rare bottles, short of going through a licensed auction house. And, as I've always said, the best investment you can make with a whiskey is to open it up and share it with friends and family. The memories you make never lose their value. And finally, a bit of sad news to report this weekend. Last September, Tom Helt shared a story with us about his battle with cancer and his very supportive oncologists. When the oncologist came in, he introduced himself, and he had a little bit of a southern accent. And I said, you spent a little time in the south? And he said, oh, I spent some time in Kentucky. And I said, oh, do you drink some whiskey? He said, I've been known to drink bourbon now and then. And I've got a few collectible bottles of bourbon on my shelf. And I said, well, I don't know if you know what the bourbon market's like right now, but uh, if I'm not going to be able to drink, I need to know so I can uh, dispose of these some way, trade them or that. And he looked at me and said, what the hell you want to get rid of that stuff for? You're going to be drinking it, and if you want to, you can even share some with me. And we've had a good relationship for the last two years. I got word from Tom's wife, Barb, this weekend that he has now been moved to hospice care. Tom, if you're able to hear this, know that we're thinking of you and your entire family right now. Folks, cancer sucks. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always post it on the Your Voice page at whiskeycast.com or track us down online. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram at WhiskeyCast. Your Voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Behind the label looks at whiskey's backstories, along with the science and history that helps us understand more about whiskey. We've had a lot of issues in the last year or so with what seems to be new restrictions on shipping whiskeys internationally or across state lines in the U.S. For the most part, those restrictions were nothing new, but as whiskey's popularity has grown, more people are paying attention to it. And as Brett Pontoni of Binney's in Chicago explained to me recently, some of those people are the ones who enforce the restrictions. Binney's used to be able to ship whiskeys all over the country, but no longer does. States tightened up legislation. Um, the couriers basically tightened up what they could and couldn't do. You know, UPS and, 
and FedEx and DHL were all under stress from various states to ensure that they weren't carrying alcohol. Um, Illinois passed a law that said that people couldn't ship in, so there was some, I think there was some sort of reciprocity from other states. If we can't send to you, you can't send to us. Things started getting cracked on in New York, and so it just all came to a halt. It just isn't. Between legislation and the couriers trying to stay compliant with their individual contracts within states, it just stopped. Yeah. You know, so, which is, for us, I mean, we're, 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 we're bricks and mortar. I mean, we're a 70-year-old bricks and mortar company. So, you know, it, it, it always has been our focus, always will be our focus. If the environment someday changes and shipping becomes you know, legal and, and more open, we would certainly love to enter into that arena, just like a lot of people. And I think that, you know, I, I, it's disappointing because we have so much to offer, uh, for people all over the country. So we just have to right now stick to the lucky people in Chicago. So what's your closest store to O'Hare airport? If somebody's flying through Chicago, say on United or American, and has a layover, <laughs> how quickly can they get to a Benny's store from O'Hare Airport? Well, they could get to, they could get, you could take a, uh, you could take the, the, the Blue Line downtown, which is about a 50 minute Blue Line ride each way. Um, you could take an Uber to our location in Des Plaines, which is relatively close to O'Hare Airport as well. Um, Portage Park, we have a couple that are within, you know, the, 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 the train would be in basically two hours to get in and out and grab the bottle. Um, you could Uber in and last as long as there's not traffic. This is Chicago. There's always traffic. There, well, yeah, there is. You got a point there. <laughs> you got a point there. But, yeah, you can, get, you can get in and out. And let's say you can get in and out in two hours and snag a bottle if you wanted to. So if you've got a five- or six-hour layover or you can schedule a five- or six-hour layover, it's doable. Well, it, it, it not only is it doable, quite frankly, since we have really not been shipping, we still have kept a very good, solid core of loyal Benny's customers who live out of state. You know, and we told them, we told them the rules, and you know, basically, we, we love you, but we can't, we just can't do this. They were fine. Can we pick up? Absolutely, you can pick up. And luckily, Chicago is an international, a national slash international enough city. What we found is a lot of our, our, our friends from out of state have friends in Chicago somewhere. So we can still, you know, we can still, if there's something that is unique to Denny's uh, and our hand picks, I mean, we are still doing, you know, a dozen scotch casks a year that are exclusive to us from various different independent bottlers and some OBs as well as, you know, hundreds of, of, of single bales from bourbon producers, craft producers, so on and so forth. And those things are strictly ours. You know, we, we have still have a, a nice following. It's a shame you can't get a location right inside the airport. <laughs> I'm sure we've looked. I'm sure we've looked. You never, you, you never know what might come up of it, but either there or in Rosemont. Because then it's a five dollar cab ride. Of course, then you'd have to check a bag when you get back to the airport. Until they start letting liquids through airport security once again. This is why we can't have nice things, gang. Of course, that doesn't apply to Whiskey Cast. You can have it twice a week now, and all of our past episodes are available at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links for the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast and our Whiskey Cast HD videos, the latest whiskey news, events, cocktail recipes, and a whole lot more. I hope you'll take a minute this week and leave a review or rating for Whiskey Cast wherever you download your podcasts from. Those reviews and ratings do figure into search results that help other whiskey lovers discover the show. And if you've already done it, thanks for your support. Our Cask Strength Conversation continues all week long online. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. And our email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. 
This is whiskey, Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch makers, creating the bold and complex flavour of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no red breast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.